Thank you. Thank you, Hope, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a very distinguished-looking group. It's my great honor and pleasure to be here with you this afternoon and spend an hour or so talking about crucial conversations. We call them the tools for talking when stakes are high. Have any of you had a crucial conversation lately? A conversation that maybe just didn't go quite the way you wanted it to go within the last few days, maybe the last week or month or so. Can you think of that? You wish it had gone a little bit differently, that the results had been, turned out differently than how they did. That's what we're going to talk about today. How do we fix that? How do we make sure that doesn't happen when we have these important conversations? So I'll give you some skills today, some tools that you can actually use to improve and strengthen your crucial conversations. What I don't want you to do is end up like this guy here. Did you see him in the news last month? Yeah. So he had a really important, crucial conversation that he needed to have. Didn't feel like going through with the wedding. Don't know if that's any of your crucial conversation. He didn't know how to talk about it, what to say. So the best that he could come up with was to call his wife and pretend he was his dad and tell her, his fiance, that the son had committed suicide and the wedding was off. That was his solution. That was better for him than having a conversation with his fiance and trying to call off the wedding. Well, his fiance was devastated, of course, and she soon called the mom and dad again just for more consolation and talking, and they found out what had gone on. Well, then there were lots of crucial conversations happening, weren't they? Weren't there? So we don't want that to happen. Don't want you to find yourself in that position. So what are we going to do so that we have the tools and the skills to know what to say and how to say it when the stakes are high? So oftentimes, when we find ourselves in this situation, we feel a little bit stuck, don't we? I just got back from New York City a couple weeks ago. A lot of you have probably been there. You've been other places across the country or around the world where you take the subway or the train. And every time you take the subway or the train and you approach your destination, the conductor will get on the PA system as you approach the platform and say, we're approaching the platform, watch the gap. Be mindful of the gap. Pay attention to the gap. What's the gap? Well, the gap's just this tiny little space that exists between the car and the platform. We just have to navigate it while we're getting off the train without causing ourselves any damage or any harm. Really, we're saying we're someplace on the car, and we want to get someplace else without having disastrous results. How do we navigate that gap? That's what we're going to talk about today. How do we close, navigate these important gaps in our life? In order for there to be a gap, we have to know that there's some sort of expected performance. So in your life, whether it's personally or professionally, individually in a relationship, an organization, or a team, there's some sort of level of performance that's expected. Oftentimes, what we find is that there's a difference or a variance in the actual observed behavior. What we see, what we hear, differs from what we were expecting. The space between our expectations and our actual performance is our gap. How are we going to close that gap? For example, you may be part of a team, maybe here at the Center for the Advancement of Leadership, you have a belief or a philosophy that the best idea always wins. When we're in our team meetings and discussing important issues, we're going to talk about them in a robust and realistic way, and the best idea is going to always win. The reality is what you sometimes see is that people form coalitions, take a stance, intimidate, withhold meaning, or stifle dialogue, and so there's a gap that exists. Wouldn't it be great if we had the skill to know how to address that gap? How do I talk about it when my expectations are different than what I'm observing or seeing? Maybe you make and keep commitments to ourselves and others as our expected performance. That's what the requirement is, what we're trying to achieve. The reality is that deadlines are missed, promises are broken, commitments are violated. Again, those are tough issues to discuss when somebody's letting us down. How do we bring that up? What do we say? How do we have a conversation about that and close 
that gap. Maybe even a personal example. So those first couple kind of apply to us professionally or at school. But oftentimes, you might know somebody who has committed to a life-saving surgery. Maybe they've had open-heart surgery to correct years of abusive behavior. And you would think that their expected performance would be to adopt some new and beneficial and helpful behaviors. Oftentimes, what we see in our work with people is only after two or three months that they will revert to their old behaviors, those same things that jeopardize their health and happiness in the first place. If you were a loved one to one of these people, how would you start that conversation? What would you say to that person to close that gap? That's what we're going to talk about today a little bit. When we uh, find ourselves in those situations where that gap exists, it kind of feels like we're stuck, don't you think? And those situations are often really profound. These are important things, critical, vital to our life and our success, our relationships with others and our teams and our organizations. Not only are they profound, they're often persistent. These are relentless problems. They have dogged us for years as we've tried to overcome them and fix this. I've been working on this relationship for years now and I don't know what to do. I don't know how to solve the problem. They're also resistant to our change efforts. So we've tried lots of different things. We've thought about what would work and we've tried it in the past and we've failed. We haven't been able to exceed, succeed. We haven't been able to move forward or get unstuck. So how are we going to do that? Let's take a look at the definition of what we consider stuck to be. This chronic inability to solve problems or achieve our aspirations or goals. So when we have these gaps and we don't know how to close them, we feel stuck. And that's what we're going to work on today. How do we get ourselves unstuck and move forward and make progress? In order to do that, I'm going to invite you to do things and think about things in a way that you have never thought about them before. If you read up here on the slide, in order to achieve results we have never achieved before, we're going to have to start doing things in a way that we have never done them before. So let's talk about what some of those skills and tools may be. Let me introduce to you Joseph Grenny. Joseph, some of you may know, he is the co-founder of Vital Smarts, the company that I'm here representing, and he is the co-author of the book Crucial Conversations, which all of the material that we're going to go over today is based upon. So I'd like to introduce Joseph to you. He's going to do an excellent job of introducing to you some of the science and the research and the thinking behind Crucial Conversations. Why is this important? Why does it matter? How can it make an impact to you in your personal and your professional lives here at school, away from school, wherever it may be? So sit back, relax, and enjoy Joseph Grenny as he introduces Crucial Conversations. Anytime you find yourself stuck, there are crucial conversations keeping you there. Our focus in this training won't be on communication. It will be on results. And what tends to keep us stuck and keeps us from producing results in our lives, in our organizations, in our relationships, are crucial conversations we're either not holding or not holding well. Let's begin exploring how to dramatically improve results by eavesdropping on a crucial conversation. A vice president, we'll call Kevin, stepped into a meeting with the CEO of the company to decide on a new location for their corporate offices. The first two execs presented their arguments for their top choices, and as expected, their points were greeted with penetrating questions from the full team. Then Chris, the CEO, pitched his preference, one that was both unpopular and potentially disastrous. However, when people tried to disagree or push back, Chris became slightly defensive. First, he raised an eyebrow. Then he raised a finger. Finally, he raised his voice, just a little. But it wasn't long until the discussion shifted from, is this a good idea, to when should we implement your ingenious plan, in spite of the team's significant reservations. When we began our research over two decades ago, our burning question was, are there a handful of moments that disproportionately affect organizational performance? team performance, and even relationship success? And if so, what are those moments? We found that much of whether you achieve stellar results or get stuck 
can be predicted by watching you during just a few minutes a day. Those moments when there are opposing opinions about a high stakes issue and emotions are running strong. We later came to call these moments crucial conversations because our research showed that they profoundly affect many outcomes like projects, productivity, safety, diversity, quality, and even the happiness and duration of a marriage. And it's not the riskiness of the conversation that determines success or failure, it's how we handle them. That's what brought us to study this VP Kevin sitting in a high stakes meeting. When it seemed everyone was shutting down and letting the CEO have his way, Kevin spoke up. Hey Chris, can I check something out with you? Everyone in the room stopped breathing. But Kevin plunged on ahead. He in essence told the CEO that he appeared to be violating his own decision-making guidelines. He was subtly using his power to push his preference rather than candidly discussing the pros and cons. But the way he did it was not just candid, it was disarmingly caring. The decision then. Chris was quiet for a moment. You're absolutely right. I've been trying to force my opinion on you. Let's go back, try again. Can you see what Kevin did here? He found a way to be both candid and respectful. It was pure magic. The team, by the way, didn't choose the boss's first preference for a location, and now years later, it's clear they chose right. But equally important, the skills Kevin used to handle this moment actually strengthened his trust and relationship with Chris. To date, we've spent over 10,000 hours watching people all over the world who have found a way to discuss remarkably risky things in astoundingly respectful ways. That's what all of us need to learn to do more consistently. And when we do, we get unstuck. Relationships improve, teams strengthen, organizational results are profoundly improved, all from handling just a few crucial conversations in a much better way. So when we show that video, people say, JD, I want to know what Kevin said. You started talking just at the wrong point. I love how he starts, hey, Chris, can I check something out with you? And then we lose it. What did he say? What did he do? What are the tools? What are the tricks? What are the skills? That's what I'm going to share with you today. What did Kevin say? So that we can become future leaders when we find ourselves in those situations, those kind of meetings, we have the skills and the ability, the courage to compassionately speak up and say, hey, can I check something with you? Okay, this will, these skills will apply in a variety of circumstances and environments. Whether you find yourself with what we call a content related issue, so a one and done issue, here and now, a violation of expectation that has occurred only once, and you wanna be able to solve that problem so that it doesn't become a repeatable pattern of behavior, I'm gonna teach you how to do that. Sometimes we don't have the skill, we don't have the courage to handle it the first time and it becomes a pattern. So you might be thinking to yourself in your mind, what do I do when I've let it go and it's become a pattern of behavior over time? How do I solve that? Can, will these skills still work? Absolutely. And what about most important of all when it's a relationship issue? When trust has been violated or when our mutual purpose, it seems to be at odds. How do we talk about tricky things that involve our relationship? Will these tools work there? Absolutely, they will. So let's start talking about them. The skill I'd like to introduce you to first is called our STATE skill. We call it STATE MY PATH. It's an acronym, S-T-A-T-E, STATE. There are five parts to it. We'll talk about each one of them individually. Share your facts, tell your story, ask for others' paths, talk tentatively, and encourage testing. You can see these five steps are broken up into two sections. The first three are what do we say? So you've had that question in your mind, what do I say? And the next follow-on question is how do I say it? And that's what the last two steps are going to be about. How do I say it? Let's get right into it and learn these skills. So the best place to start is with our facts. I'd like you next time you're in a crucial conversation to start with your facts, to share your facts. How many of you think you can define for me what a fact is? If I ask, boiling hot, 
Maybe it's drafty, it's cool. If we were really chasing down the fact about the temperature of this room, where would we go? Pass, or you have said to someone, or you've been part of a conversation when somebody says, you're too negative. Is that a fact? What's the fact? Yeah, the fact is something more like the last few times new ideas have been proposed, you only gave reasons why they wouldn't work. That's what we could see. That's what we could hear. Your too negative is what we thought about what we saw and heard. What about this example? Somebody says, you need to be easier to work with. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're too hard to approach. Saw and heard. One last example, maybe a personal one here. What about when somebody says to us, you are always late? Is that a fact? That seems like one. The fact might be more like the last two times we've been out to dinner, our friends have all ordered by the time we arrive. That's what we saw and heard. We tell ourselves about what we saw and heard. You're always late. So that's the difference here. We want to start with our facts. Start with what you see and hear. And as we talked about at the beginning, you may need to include how this is different than what your expectation was. So this was my expectation. This is what I'm seeing and hearing. There seems to be a gap in here. That's what I'd like to talk about. How do we close that gap? Avoid sharing your interpretation of those facts. We're going to do that, but it's going to come a little bit later. Just start with the facts. For example, so those of you who are saying, gee, I think that sounds great. I need a little script. Can you give me some prompts? What I should say? Just start with some sentences like this. I noticed that, and then share your facts. The last three times we talked about this. I was expecting to receive this at 3 o'clock, and now it's 4. Good introductions, easy ways for us to share our facts and start the conversation on the right foot. Here's an example with some actors portraying some of these behaviors that we're talking about. Craig in here is the leader. He's on the left, and he's going to give Will here on the right some coaching or some feedback. He does a horrible job of starting with the facts. What I'd like you to think about as you watch the clip are what are the implications? What are the ramifications on their relationship and their results when Cragen fails to start with the facts? Let's sit back and watch. I just don't think we can get much more. You know, I, I've done everything in my power and we're stuck at 800. Well, maybe I can be of some help here. I've had my ear to the ground and I've heard some rumblings. You've got people problems, serious ones. Really? Uh-huh. I think my team is just as good as anyone else's. No, your, your people don't have people problems. You have people problems. Look, Will, there's, there's just a way about you that doesn't work all that well. You're, you're kidding. No. I've never had problems before, none, none that I knew of. Well, do insensitive, awkward, backward people know it? I, I don't think so. <laughs> Wait a minute, so, so what are you saying? That I'm inept at dealing with people? Look, let me be more specific here. Now, I've seen you run some meetings and you have no control. So your employees don't have any respect for you. And you're also very easy on problems. What does that mean exactly? Well, you let your employees walk all over you. It's like you're running a country club, Will. Now, in my day, we knew how to get tough. You know what I mean? No. No, I don't. All right. Here's a trick. Now, when you need to get tough, get tough. Of course, you don't want to get tough when you shouldn't because that would be a mistake, right? So be forceful. But not too forceful. Okay, so, uh, let me see if I understand this. Uh, I'm supposed to do the right stuff, but don't do the wrong stuff. I, I couldn't have stated it more clearly myself. That's probably true. He couldn't have stated it more clearly. It's uh, awful. This is a really ineffective example. But this is what we're talking about. I don't want you to do. How does Will feel in this situation? If you're with Will and you're sitting there and you're getting this kind of feedback, do you know what to do? Do you know why people are drawing these kind of conclusions, unattractive conclusions? Do you know the context, the meaning of any of this? No, because we haven't started with any facts. The benefits of starting with facts are it lays the groundwork. They are the foundation for our conversation. They provide context 
and meaning for the entire conversation. The facts are more persuasive, they're more influential, because we know that they have something that's a behavior that's been seen and observed versus our conclusion or interpretation of them. They're the least insulting. When we start with things like Cragen did, people wonder, why are you drawing such an unattractive conclusion about me? I don't understand that. I'd like to know the source of this. Why are we even having this conversation? What are we talking about? Why is it important? Start with the facts. It's our feelings and stories. Those are the names that we really attribute to our interpretation or our conclusions about the facts that keep us from the facts. Have you been in those conversations before where somebody says, you're too negative? You're always late? You're hard to approach? What's your initial response? You go after them because of this inflammatory word that they've used. What do you mean I'm always late? And you never get around to having the real conversation about what I'd like to do is see if there's a way that we could figure out to be on time next time we go out with our friends in order with everybody else. That's what we really want to talk about, but we end up having this other conversation because we get off track when we don't start with the facts. Okay, second skill, tell your story. Now this is the right time to start to add your interpretation of the facts. This is the next step. Why do we tell the story? Because the facts by themselves always won't, won't always paint a complete picture. If I came up to you and said, you know what, the last few times we've been out to dinner, our friends have always ordered before us. Just wanted you to know. They're not going to have any idea why we're saying that to them or what it means. They need some interpretation, some conclusion. What do these facts mean? It's our judgments, our conclusions. It adds clarity, the attributions that we've given to other people. So the reality is our stories that we start telling ourselves about these facts are our biases, our preconceived notions, the perceptions, our interpretations, conclusions about the facts. Why is that valuable? To understand that we're telling ourselves a story of sorts. Because the minute that we realize that we are the writer, director, author, or producer of these stories, we realize that there might be hundreds of stories that could be told from the same set of facts. And it allows us to abdicate our moral authority and certainty that our interpretation is the only one. So when you're going to tell your story, start with a script that sounds something like this. It leads me to conclude that I believe that these facts are starting to make me think. Okay? Last step. Ask for others' paths. So in everything that we've been doing, we've been trying to encourage the free flow of meaning and dialogue. We want to get other people's point of view into this conversation and talk to them. So when we finish with our facts and our stories, we're going to ask to see if we're on the right track. Remember when you were in fifth grade and you had to do your science fair project and you had to come up with your hypothesis? Your hypothesis, was it proven, was it right? No, it was your thing, the thing that you wanted to test and see if it was right. And so you went out and asked questions and did research and gathered data. That's what we're saying here about your story. Accept it for what it is, it's your test. And you want to find out if you're right or not. The way you're going to do that is by asking for others' paths. So be open. Adopt an adopting an attitude of, I already know, is going to make you lose out on valuable information. Instead, say, how do you see it? Can you help me understand? What's your view? Open-ended questions that'll get the other person contributing and talking to the conversation. Conversely, don't use questions such as, isn't that the case? You agree, right? What can we do to make sure this doesn't happen again? Why are those fundamentally flawed? Because they're closed-ended questions. They're presupposing that a story that we've created is the right one, and we're just looking for confirmation of it instead of understanding and clarity. So be really careful when you craft your question that you use to ask for others' paths. Okay, now we know what to say. How are we going to say it? First skill, we're going to talk tentatively. What does that mean, tentative talk? Am I suggesting that you need to be kind of passive? or meek, not really. Talking tentatively is what we refer to as the modulating aspect of our crucial conversation. Modulating is to adjust the volume 
a little bit. So maybe we use different words. It's really our choice of words that's going to make all the difference when we're thinking about talking tentatively. A real simple example that we can all relate to is when we're on the phone with somebody. When you're trying to be sensitive and aware of how the other person feels and you need to go, what do you say? You say something like, I'm sorry, I, I, I've got to let you go. You've probably got to go. Something polite and understanding like that that lets them off the hook and gets you off the phone versus our choice of words when we say, well, I got to go. The, the choice of words in all instances makes a huge difference to us in people's willingness and ability to speak up and contribute to the conversation. So tell your story as a story, not as a fact. Allow room for other stories to be shared. <laughs> and stay with me here on the joke. In all cases, avoid absolutes. <laughs> all right, very good. All right, so absolutes aren't going to help us as we're seeking to add information to the conversation. Let's take a look at this in action. Here's some degrees of tentativeness. We have three, four coworkers together. Three of them are going to kind of speak up and participate. You'll see that one of them is a little bit passive and submissive. Think about his results. How, what are they going to be? Is he going to be a contributor to the team and make an important difference? You'll notice somebody else is really kind of forceful and attacking. Similarly, consider what kind of results is that person going to get with the team and individually? And then you'll see somebody that we think demonstrates the best blend, which we call talking tentatively and think about and consider how their results will be much more improved than the other two. Boy, I don't know. This is a hard one. Updating our software will solve a lot of operational problems, but tying up all that money right now could present some big challenges. It's a real stumper, all right. Um, and I, I know this is an unpopular stance, but I, and I, I don't want you to jump down my throat on this, but we have to make a decision soon. Well, okay, maybe not soon, but soon-ish. You think there's any doubt? I mean, it's obvious. We have to make a decision right now or we're all going to pay. The clock has run out, people. Absolutely. We have to move, but we don't have enough data. Once we get enough data, then we can decide, period. Well, data's good, right? I mean, I mean it's tough to make good decisions without data. But then again, we can't afford to wait around forever either. I mean, nobody gets ahead by waiting around. <laughs> uh, but that, that whole part about no data has me concerned. I, I mean, you, you can't just... You come from a long line of talkers, do you? Either way, we're probably doomed. Uh, or, or at least doomed-ish. It seems to me that we're concerned about two things, and we want to balance them both. We want to make a decision based on solid data, and we also don't want to take too long. Is that how others see it? Yeah. Absolutely. So, since we need to make a quick decision and do so with good information, what if we take, say, no more than five minutes and discuss the quality of our data? Then we can agree to either move on or to keep researching. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Sure, yeah. Good, okay. Okay, so you saw all three demonstrated. The best example, clearly, was not the person who was passive or submissive. What kind of results is that person going to get? The gentleman in the lime green shirt. People going to look to him as a leader? Find inspiration in him and his ideas? When things get going tough, are they going to seek him out? Absolutely not. What about the gentleman in the gray shirt that was a little bit more forceful or attacking? Is his style going to meet his needs over time? Don't think so. It's going to offend a lot of people. People are going to see his style as more of coercion and attacking. The best blend, again, is the gentleman who was in the blue that adopted the tone of tentative talk in his tenor. He was influential, persuasive, courageous, compassionate, respectful, built confidence. What's the difference between the results in these three columns? The two columns on the left, not going to get very good results over time. You may think we're going to get results if we're in the passive column. At least I'm not offending anybody, haven't hurt anybody's feelings. There are a lot of people who think that if we're forceful, that's what needs to happen. 
Somebody needs to take a stand right now and speak up. But if we do that, we risk offending others if we don't do it well. And then over time, we lose our effectiveness. So the person who's going to get the best results is the person who can adopt the tentative talk. So if you're too forceful, you're using things like this. If these sound familiar to you, discard them. Don't use them anymore and adopt some different scripts, maybe like these on the right-hand side of the screen. We've shared our facts, we've told our story, and we say something like, in my opinion, maybe it would make more sense to some of these things that are a little bit more modulated in their tone. Okay, our last step of the five, to put it all together, what do we say, how do we say it? Encourage testing. What do we mean when we say encourage testing? Really, we've been talking about this the whole time. It's the underlying philosophy of everything we're saying and talking about. Everything that we do in this conversation is designed to invite other people to contribute their meaning to the pool that we're creating. So remember, this is our purpose. Think about this really as a figurative pool that we're trying to fill. You've got meaning, you've got facts, you have data, you have stories that you want to add to this pool. You turn on your faucet and start to fill the pool with everything that you want to contribute. What I'm saying to you is you need to be aware of the other person and make sure they have an equal opportunity to turn their faucet on as well. And when they turn their faucet on and start filling the pool at the same volume, then we don't reach over and turn theirs off. We don't turn ours on harder to compensate for what they're saying. We make sure that they're equally and evenly matched so that we can get everybody's meaning into the pool. The more meaning we have into this pool of dialogue that we're having, the better decision we're going to make, the better results we're going to get, the better relationships we're going to have. So in all cases, this is one of the most important things that you can do. And this is really a matter more of heart than mind. So make sure that when you go into these conversations and you can find yourself in the middle of them, that you've got your heart in the right place as you start to think about them. So our only limit to how strongly we can express our opinion is our willingness to be equally vigorous in encouraging others to challenge it, all right? So let's take a look at a couple of examples. We've got a couple of workers here for you, Scott and Michelle. Scott's going to blow it. He's going to do a horrible job. What he's actually going to do is model what typically happens at school, at work, at home, at play, wherever it may be. He's got a tough issue he wants to bring up with Michelle, but he doesn't know what to say and he doesn't know how to say it. Watch what he does wrong when he doesn't use the state skills and think about what the implications are to the results for him personally and with his relationship with Michelle and maybe the others that are in the surrounding area listening and paying attention and impacted by this. Let's take a look. Hi, Michelle. I have this really important rush. What's with you anyway? What do you mean? Oh, come on. You know what I mean. Actually, I don't. Every time I come in here, you're either surfing the web, or you're playing a video game, you're on a personal call, you're texting your friends, and when you're not wasting time with personal business, you manage to look busy, but don't do much. That's what you think of me? No, that's the good part. The bad part is, is that when you do eventually get around to working, you only work on projects that you like working on. You put off all the other jobs. So I think that when I have something for you to do for me, that it'll probably get delayed, or worse, it won't get done at all. That's really what you think of me. It's not all, but it's a start. <laughs> well, here's a news flash. I'm not gonna take your verbal abuse or your groundless insults any longer, okay? Ground. <laughs> at least you know where I stand. We know people like that, don't we? They think that's their duty or their obligation to let us all know where they stand. Yeah, that's what you need to do with people. You just need to put them in their place. Let them know who's boss. This is ineffective. It doesn't work. But it's what we commonly use or what we commonly see. And when we're new emerging leaders, 
We need to be able to break through that paradigm. This is the kind of behavior that we've seen modeled. We think it must work. This is must, must be how people get ahead, how they advance in the corporation, in the organization. What I'm suggesting to you today and inviting you to consider is that there's a different way, a better way, a better model for you to follow. Let's watch as Scott redoes this conversation. Notice that the content's exactly the same. Nothing has changed. He still has the same impressions or ideas about Michelle that he wants to talk about. But he has figured out how to do it in a respectful, caring, compassionate, courageous way. Notice when he shares his facts. Notice when he tells his story. Look for the question that he asks. Notice how he does it in a tentative way. And that in everything he does, he's encouraging testing. He's saying, I don't know if I'm on the right track. I'm the new guy here. I'm not really sure if what I'm observing is right. I want to check it out and see. Let's watch him and see how he does a better job. Realizing, of course, that this is in real life. We don't get video do-overs in real life. We've got to do it right the first time. So let's learn, listen and learn so that we can do it the right the first time when we find ourselves in this situation. Hi, Michelle. I have this really important rush job that I need you to... Could, could we talk about something that's starting to bother me? Sure. What's up? Um, you know that I'm fairly new around here, and I'm finding it difficult to get some of my work done. Um, as I've thought about what might help, I realized I ought to talk to you about something that's starting to get in the way. Would that be okay? Whoa. I guess you're not into small talk, are you? I wouldn't say anything, really, but I'm, I'm feeling stressed. Um, as I mentioned, some of my work requires help from you to get done, and it seems like the last few times that I've come in here, you've been working on something other than your job. Uh, one time it was the internet, another time a game. Um, you've, you've closed your screen and put things away in the past as I've approached you. So, what are you saying? I don't work? Actually, I don't know what to think. I just know that when you quickly put things away or, or snap your screen closed, it kind of makes me think that you're trying to cover up something. I can see how it would. Well, and, and to make matters worse, last week when I came to find out how my job was coming twice, you couldn't find the work orders. I'm beginning to think that maybe at best you're a little bit disorganized. And at worst, maybe you're just not working very hard. If, if I'm off base or I'm not being unfair, I'd like to know. We're under crazy deadlines, so we tend to work in bits and starts. Sometimes we're working full out, other times... It's a much better job that time for Scott. Going to have a lot different impact on his relationship with Michelle and the results that they're going to get working together and as a team and as an organization. So when you find yourself in a tricky or tough conversation next time, I want you to remember these skills, the state skills. Share your facts, tell your story, ask for others' paths, talk tentatively, and encourage testing. Let's give it a try. Let's see how you can do. Got some examples for you here to work with. What I'd like you to do is find a learning partner for the next five or ten minutes. So maybe the person that's just at your elbow, turn to him really quickly and introduce yourself. Okay, does everybody have a partner, somebody you can work with? Terrific. Here we go. Now I've got an assignment for you. In your learning partnership, I'd like you to assume one of two roles. I'd like somebody to volunteer to be the initiator. Who will be the initiator first in your learning partnership? Just turn to each other and say, I will. Be a volunteer. All right. Whoever is not the initiator, is going to be our coach. So the initiator is the person who's going to practice using the skills I just taught you first. All right, initiators? The coach is going to listen and respond and keep you on track. So coach, your duty and obligation is to listen. Did they start in a warm and a welcoming way? Did they share the facts first? Did they tell their story? Did they ask you a question 
that made you feel safe and encouraged you to contribute to the conversation? Was their talk tentatively? And in everything they did, did they encourage testing? It's what the feedback you'll be giving, coaches, is to your initiator. Initiator, I'm going to put a scenario up here on the screen for you to read. I want you to read it and determine what problem it is you're trying to solve. Do you think you have a one-time issue? Is it a pattern issue? Is it a relationship issue? Why is that diagnosis important? It will impact the facts that you t choose to highlight and the story that you choose to tell. Remember, we are trying to get unstuck. What does unstuck mean? I don't want to have this conversation again. I want to solve the problem and move forward. When you have figured out what the facts are, what your story is, and you may want to write those down and kind of come up with a little script, figure out what question you'll ask, turn to your partner and use the state skills and hold your first new crucial conversation. Coaches, at the conclusion, share feedback. I'm going to give you five minutes to work on this first one. So take a minute, maybe a minute and a half, to read the scenario and formulate what you're going to say. Use those state skills. Share it with your coach. And then coach, take a little bit of time to give some feedback and counsel. After five minutes, we'll switch roles. And I'll put another scenario up on the screen. The person who's the coach will assume the role of initiator. The person who is the initiator will assume the role of coach. And you'll, the other person in your partnership will have a chance to practice the skills as well. Any questions about what your assignment is? OK, here we go. Five minutes starts now. All right, time's up. If I could have your attention again for a minute, please. Thank you. Thanks for being great coaches. I heard some great coaching going on out there, and I heard some excellent use of the state skills. You guys are off to a tremendous start. Some of you may be saying, OK, JD, I did this. I followed all the skills and steps that you gave me. But what happens when they push back now? Now, we're not trying to solve the problem here today. We're just trying to get used to using these skills. But if you want a quick tip, you just start over again. So you use this. You express. You ask the question. And you're going to get some feedback. And then you listen. And now you have a new set of facts that you can start with. Let me make sure that I understood what you just said. And you say those facts. And you start to talk about the way that you feel or what your story is about the facts you just heard. And then you ask another clarifying question. You can use that loop over and over repeatedly until you have come to a conclusion or resolution of the issue. OK, next person's turn. You ready? Here we go. Here's the next scenario. Again, five minutes. Study it. Use your skills, coaches. Give them some constructive, helpful, useful feedback. If you feel like you want another chance to do it, initiator said, I'd like to try that again. Five minutes starts right now. <laughs> OK, time's up. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful. A great introduction to you of this skill. As I bring my time to a close here, I'd just like to offer you an invitation. If you've liked a little bit about what you've heard today and you'd like to know more, there's an opportunity for you to do that. On the skills summary card that's placed on your chair, you'll find there's a space there that you can fill out with your contact information. You can put your name, your email address, your phone number, whatever it is. And we'll give you access to a lot of the tools and resources that we make available to people that come to our classes that last a day or two days long. You can go into our video vault and see some of the vid videos that are like those that I've shown you today that will help you as you develop your own skills or maybe as you train and teach others. There's an assessment there that you can take. Well, don't we all like taking tests about ourselves? That's fun, right? Who wouldn't want to do that? It'll give you an, an assessment of your tendency during these crucial conversations to move either maybe to the passive submissive side or the more forceful or attacking side. It's real simple, take you five minutes, kind of fun, and it'll help you learn a little bit about yourself in these crucial conversations. And it'll also give you access to some tips 
from some of our authors that you can download on audio and listen to as you continue to develop and hone these skills. But most importantly, the reason for filling out the card would be that we have some copies of Crucial Conversations that we're going to give away. All right, we love free stuff. So if you'll fill your card out and tear it off and kind of pass it to the center here, we'll collect those in just a minute and we'll do a drawing and give some people copies of the book Crucial Conversations. As you fill that out, can I just leave you with one closing idea or thought, please? I'd just like to share a poem with you, if I can. Think about the answer to who am I as I share this poem. I am your constant companion. I am your greatest helper or your heaviest burden. I will push you onward or drag you down to failure. I am completely at your command. Half the things you do, you might just as well turn over to me, and I will be able to do them quickly and correctly. I am easily managed. You must merely be firm with me. Show me exactly how you want something done, and after a few lessons, I will do it automatically. I am the servant of all great people, and alas, of all failures as well. Those who are great, I have made great. Those who are failures, I have made failures. I am not a machine, though I work with all the precision of a machine plus the intelligence of a human being. You may run me for profit or run me for ruin. It makes no difference to me. Take me, train me, be firm with me, and I will put the world at your feet. Be easy with me, and I will destroy you. Who am I? I am habit. I have shared with you today some skills, some tools, some habits, if you will, that we have seen benefit and bless the lives of individuals and organizations across the world. I promise you that if you will start to practice and use these state skills in your crucial conversations, that you will see a dramatic improvement in the results of your relationships. I am so grateful that I've had the opportunity to be here today with you. I wish you the best in your future endeavors. This is a great group of potential and future leaders. I hope that we have the chance to path cr for our paths to cross again. Let's give away some books. Where are some cards that are filled out? Did you pass your cards to the center? Here we go. If you want a chance, here we go. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks this for walking. This one is a really good one. Okay, that's a good one. All right, who else? We got some more? Thank you. Thank, well, thank you, sir. Good. Okay, that it? Nope. Voting's closed. Another pile. Thank you. Everybody in that wants to be in? All right, here we go. For the first copy of Crucial Conversations goes to... Deba Jenkins. Hey, thanks for being here. Okay, next copy, next and last copy of Crucial Conversations to Derek Johnson. Congratulations, Derek. Thanks for being here today. All right, thanks again for the opportunity and the invitation. You guys have a great day.